Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. The Dow has set a new dubious record. Ross gives us the story on crude and the U.S. dollar. Publisher of the VR newsletters, Mark Leibovich, joins us from Arizona to talk about the markets, opportunities, oil, and geocosmic links to financial activity. He also has a special offer for our listeners. Vancouver realtor Steve Soretsky comments on rising mortgage rates and whether they've put a damper on skyrocketing real estate prices. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray and his CFO, Shaheem Ali. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Good to be with you, Jim. The Dow set a new record that I don't think anybody's proud of. What is no, that record? No, I mean, we, we all know how bad the markets have been in the last uh, few months. But, you know, here we are, 11 out of 12 weeks now the Dow has been down. And that sets a new record. I mean, you know, we're talking about not just the last bull market run from 2009 in a correction or the or the break into 1974. No, in 1929. No, this 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 takes out all of that. Now, you know, in terms of the absolute decline or the percentage declines, yes, there have been bigger ones, but uh, this one is uh, it's getting long in the tooth. Let's put it that way. But finding a bottom, whether it uh, be an individual indice or a stock, we really want to see some type of stability kicking in, and. Uh, you know, I've got the really good indicators that are just screaming out right now to say that uh, bottoms should be putting in place. And, but you really want to see these sort of capitulation lows where people are just throwing in the towel. And I'm still not seeing a lot of that. Um, the uh, uh, We've managed to see it in one or two of the indices, but uh, what you need here is a capitulation, a decent bounce, a test of the low, and then the upside reversal. Because so you want to see that money starting to come back in. Um, you know, dead cat bounces are the type of thing that uh, are are tradable, but only for the most nimble, those that want to be just glued to their machine throughout the day watching the quotes. But in reality... Anybody who wants to invest in the markets should be waiting a little bit here to, uh, in terms of any new money, um, just wait for some stability to kick in and then uh, feel better about the positions. What's going on with crude? Well, crude uh, had its uh, worst stretch here uh, this week that we've seen in uh, ages. Uh, we got down uh, below $108. Yeah, yeah. Below 108 during the week, closed to off uh, around 110. Um, this is it's a hard break, but it's still within the dominant uptrend. Um, the the key support uh, I think is probably not a lot lower than this. It's probably uh, in the 105 to uh, 107 range, and um, the um, in terms of the the stocks in the sector getting some nice oversolds towards moving averages. So, you know, I take a look at those, uh, uh, the Canadian names in particular, uh, the ones that uh, are putting in some uh, good earnings now with, uh, you know, any price over $80 for these people is pretty darn good. So um, when you see corrections like we've had this week from the, the low 120s down under 108, um, 
in what is still an uptrend, then that does provide an opportunity for uh, for the oil stocks. Is the U.S. dollar still charging along? Two days of correction and then back up again. Um, it's uh, in really, if you take a look at the trend, uh, this uh, was a, a pretty small correction as of this week. We closed off at uh, 104 and change. Um, there's excellent support down at 100 that uh, thought might have have a chance of being tested, but we're we're nowhere near that. Um, this uh, this move still seems to be reasonably buoyant. I would not want to risk it to be low 101. Uh, that would be the uh, the maximum. Um, you know, and if we take a look then at the inverse of markets that should be. Uh, um, reacting with this, uh, you see that uh, the gold market stuck in the same type of a trading range uh, the last uh, month and a half, um, tried to rally this week as the dollar came off, but it's still stuck in its trading range. And um, the we're entering into, as far as the metals are concerned, uh, an interesting seasonal. Um, you typically have a low uh, in the latter part of June and uh, then come to life. And uh, if you can have a nice breakout during July, it tends to have running room. So we're looking at uh, the gold market then with the the potential. Uh, if we can close above 1880, I think you're looking at the opportunity for a pretty good run into the, I would say, at least $100 and possibly more than that. But the um, the catalyst is going to be the uh, a close through 1880, and although sort of giving up uh, some money uh, waiting for that breakout, uh, once it happens, then I don't think you have to risk a lot. Um, once, uh, once you're through the resistance, all you've probably got to risk there is maybe 10 or $15 at the most. Ross, thank you so much for the update. Always uh, nice to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Mark Leibovit next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He's speaking to us from Arizona. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Mark. Yeah, and it's about 108 degrees out there, so uh, maybe maybe warmer, but uh, that's summer in uh, Arizona. Nice, uh, nice clear day, though. Vancouver had those temperatures last year at this time, and it killed 800 people, so... We don't know how to deal with the heat in Vancouver. We're usually uh, 22 degrees Celsius, 72 Fahrenheit in the summer. Well, people here tend to leave, so the people that uh, have any, you know, like life experience here are up, up in their cabins or out of the state uh, this time of year for a couple months. So uh, that's uh, you can plan for it here is what I'm saying. We know it's coming. Do you have a special offer for our listeners? Yeah, we do, and I want to say that it's, VRTrader.com. I'm not a uh, financial advisor, nor do I provide financial advice, and we do educational stuff regarding technical analysis and uh, individual stocks and ec the economic situation, and we uh, try to ascertain, you know, where we think things are going and what needs to be changed and so forth to help people understand where they might best place their money or... Uh, or avoid places putting their money. Anyway, there is a special 50% off, 2022 half off, 2020HALFOFF. You go to vrtrader.com, and that's the promo code that you enter in the appropriate slot. Do we need to see a capitulation low for the stock markets to reverse and head higher? 
You know, I don't know. Rules are made to be broken. That's a good question, uh, Jim. I don't know. There tends to be more of a, um, a V bottom type formation. So I guess part of that could be, you know, capitulation. And then you, you see the V bottom. And that's what we saw last uh, March 2020. And we saw it back. It was like a double bottoming formation back in the 2008-9 bottom um, crash in 1987. And, yes, I was there for that, uh, you know, straight down and just sort of went sideways for about three or four months before it started to really show some recovery. So uh, there's no fast fast rule. Um, Sentiment has to be negative. And, uh, you know, probably the worst news is at that uh, that event. So... um, Let's see what happens, what type of bottom it tends to uh, create when, when, when that occurs. Is it possible to tell if the stock markets are in a severe correction, a bear market, or awaiting a crash? I'm, I'm more in the awaiting of the uh, crash scenario. I've been pretty bearish here for a while. For those who subscribe to our newsletter, they saw that we had recommended and suggested inverse ETFs in the S&P and in the Dow Industrials and in the NASDAQ. And um, we sort of post these are hypothetical n- numbers, you know, that we put up on the screen if you had acted upon those. But uh, pretty, pretty darn good uh, numbers. And, you know, we continue to trade those on paper. It's a hypothetical portfolio on the website. And so far we've done uh, done pretty good. So I think, uh, you know, bottom line is the, the stocks tend to go down faster than they go up. I'm um, watching financial television and listening to uh, the geniuses there, and they're all figuring out, well, when should I buy something, and is it good to buy now? And, yeah, if you hold it for three or five years, you know, well, you, I'm sure you won't regret it. Uh, what about making money today? You know, uh, why is it only a buy and hold scenario when, when they're inverse ETFs? If you're going to go along the market, many people say you're better off just owning the S&P or the NASDAQ, put it away in a form of an ETF and just sit for years and years and years. And then it's a diversified portfolio. And, uh, you know, you're not going to get the super 10,000% type winners, but you're going to participate in the market. But why aren't they recommending the inverse ETFs when it's clear that you're in a bear market? In fact, uh, I don't have to wait for the 20 per- magic 20% number. I mean, we turned uh, bearish. We, you know, we had, we had a little icon on our screen uh you know, beware bear, you know, last fall, you know, saying, you know, bear looms around and, you know, be careful. It was pretty, it's pretty clear that something was coming. You don't know how severe until it starts to unfold. So it, it's sort of frustrating that, you know, I believe the market will ultimately go lower and uh, either you're in cash and just, you know, stick it in the mattress or put it in a, uh, CD or something, or you try to make some money, uh, which is afforded the opportunity in front of you. So that's what we do here at VR Trader. Have severe stock market corrections like this happened in the past within an ongoing bull market? Yes, there's a lot of shakes in uh, a bull market. You could you you can say that the March uh, 2020 low tied to COVID was a correction in a uh, bull market because uh, we dipped sharply. Uh, happened in about, what, 10 days, and then uh, started to move back to new highs and ultimately topped out the end of last year. So that was a shake in a bull market. But, you know, there's also the thought, Jim, you know, you look at the big picture charts, uh, go back 100 years, you go back all the way back to, uh, you know, it was at 1780s or 90s when they were trading outside uh, under that tree where now the New York Stock Exchange is located and you take the big picture chart it's just a slow upward trajectory you know with dips along the way for you know a couple hundred years so we're always apparently in a bull market it's just a question of what kind of a dips and what your your confidence level is is to stay with it and uh in that sense you know i guess the long termers are correct because you know even the communist chinese like to make money not really communist, I guess, because there's plenty of billionaires over there. So I like to see they like to see prices go up, commodity prices go up, you know, businesses, uh, stock prices go up, and so forth. So, you know, you can you can argue that any bear market is a correction in the bull market if you take that 100, 200 year perspective. We always seem to come back to new highs at some point, and when that'll change, you know, I guess uh, anybody can predict. I guess when the asteroid hits, I guess. Uh, there won't be any more bull markets. 
When do stock markets tend to climb a wall of worry? You know, that's the definition of a bull market. I mean, basically, when it's going up, people don't believe it. I mean, after the, the way you keep, I keep citing the COVID thing from 2020. So that's the most recent event. I mean, you know, it's crashed, starts coming up. People were thinking as it was going up, it was just temporary. The, the, the virus supposedly was going to kill everybody on the planet, whether you got a vaccine or not. So actually, they wanted you to take the vaccine. So uh, the, produ- the producer will be happy with my response on that one since he wanted me to talk about vaccines. But in any of Vaccines turned out to be a bunch of poppycock for a lot of people. Uh, but in the event, yes, they were worried all the way up that the other shoe was going to drop. Uh, new versions of the virus suddenly appeared. Uh, there was, you know, misinformation provided. So we were climbing a wall of worry uh, through that entire period. So uh, there's a general rule. This is what you want to see. It's when there's euphoria and everybody believes everything is perfect. Uh, that's when you get uh, concerned and when things are really negative and people want to jump out of the window, that's usually just the opposite. But bull markets generally climb a wall of worry, so bad news along the way or uncertainty is uh, is good news for uh, stock prices. And this is just a theoretical, hypothetical statement based on what we read and what we've seen over the decades in terms of the markets. But the bottom line is how do you make money with this stuff? You know what I mean? you got to try to make money with it. And that's where you try to get some timing sense, which is what I do. I mean, the last time Timer Digest was published, they stopped publishing back in 2019. They said I was Timer of the Year in the U.S., so I guess at some point I get a sense of what uh, the market is uh, going to do or not do. This week, the Fed raised the bank rate 75 basis points to help fight inflation. How high could interest rates go if that's their goal? Well, you know, they, they can look back at what Paul Volcker did back in the uh, late... Uh, 70s, early 80s, you know, would he take interest rates up to 15%? I mean, anything is possible. The problem is, and, you know, this is a big bone of contention for me, and I I spend a little time, actually a lot of time in my newsletter, and I'm probably wasting my time doing it because people are looking at it and laughing and saying, what's this guy talking about? But, you know, my feeling is the Federal Reserve shouldn't even exist. It should be abolished, and I keep saying this. And, you know, there has been some talk among some Congress People here in the U.S., I heard some interviews in the last few days that maybe we need to revisit the Fed's goals and, and revisit, you know, the legislation that created the Fed and see if they're really doing their job. I mean, this is the first step. It may take another generation until they finally get rid of it. It's an arcane institution um, created back in 1913. It was snuck through, I think it was Christmas Eve. Uh, it's destroyed the U.S. dollar. It's caused, uh, I believe, uh, I think you even told me about eight recessions during the course of its existence. Uh, ben Bernanke, I keep talking about this point, he admitted that the Fed helped cause the uh, Depression back in the uh, 1920s, late 20s, early 30s because they didn't expand the money supply. They actually tightened it. He actually was quoted about 10, 12 years ago saying that. I mean, we got to get rid of the Fed. And the Fed, is that's a whole other discussion. You know, they, they don't control inflation. They control one piece of it, which I guess is demand. If you should try raise rates so much that people can't afford to buy or do anything, but the inflation is not caused by only the Fed. It, had, it, it mainly was caused by uh, crazy expenditures on the part of the uh, U.S. government, and the Democrats are in charge this time, though you can argue Republicans spend a lot of money, too. But, you know, the debt, the constant spending of money, I think they just send, what, a billion dollars to Ukraine when they're not even defending the U.S. borders, which is where the money should be spent. But instead, they worry about defending another country. And unfortunately, that's going to lead to uh, the world war, which I feel is coming because we're sticking our nose into something that we shouldn't be doing. And uh, the Democrats, for, for at least in the last 10 or 15 years, as best I can see, have been antagonistic toward Russia. So they're trying to provoke something. So that that's a whole other discussion. But the Fed is not going to control it. You're going to have to calm down the war or eliminate that war situation. And uh, you're going to have to allow commodities to freely be produced and flow. The most classic example is the crude oil, which has been frozen in the, uh, in the U.S. And uh, the supply issues were all created because of COVID. And, you know, it's going to take time to work out of that. So by jacking rates up three-quarters of a point and another three-quarters of a point, you know, it's just going to hurt the economy but not necessarily solve the problem. Other issues, have more important issues like what's going on in Europe 
and what's going on with the production of needed commodities uh, in a free in a free uh, market marketplace has to unfold. So uh, there's a great book. Um, you probably you know heard of it. Uh, G. Edward Griffin's The Creature from Jekyll Island. I have a picture of it on my uh, newsletter uh, down at the bottom of, of the copy there. And, you know, it basically, it's a, oh, it's a 600 page document. It came out, I think, about 20 years ago or so. You gotta read the book. It basically says, you know, the Fed was created back at Jekyll Island. Um, you know, I think it's Georgia or South Carolina. I'm not sure where the island is. I have to double check my, my, um, details on that but uh the big the big boys sat down created the fed shoved it through congress the original shareholders of the fed were private corporations uh banks themselves uh none of that is discussed or talked about though it, whether it currently exists or was changed or hidden over the years is to be seen and um you know it just uh it just it's just this institution so meanwhile if we go back and look at history I have a little piece on that in my my newsletter as well. Andrew Jackson didn't care for the banks. Uh, first he did was back in 1835, he decided that we shouldn't have debt the way we have debt now in the U.S., so he got rid of the debt, then he turned around and he, he um, disbanded the National Bank, which existed, so that's like Biden or Trump or somebody issuing an executive order and saying, well, goodbye, Federal Reserve, you don't exist anymore. So he got rid of that, so the country... At least in the U.S., I know you're, you're on the Canadian side, man, it was different, but, you know, for many, for almost, uh, what, 80, 90 years, there was no national bank, no Federal Reserve in the United States, and uh, somehow, even though we had the Civil War and there were a lot of good and bad events along the way, we, we did survive and grow, and uh, if anything, uh, as Bernanke quoted uh, recently, or back in 2008-10, about what happened in the 20s and 30s, that did more to hurt things and help things. So we need to disband it, and I think that would be a big help. Let the free marketplace determine interest rates and determine, you know, use of capital, not an institution which isn't run by incompetent economists. We've already seen that with the bad decisions they made. Uh, Alan Greenspan was noted for this back in the – in fact, he was the, uh, the, the steward of the Federal Reserve at the time of the 1987 market crash. So obviously he did a great job there, and uh, he was renowned for slamming on the pedal and slamming on the brake, and there was a lot of indecisiveness about what to do. And uh, I know I'm ranting a little bit here, but we really have to get down to getting rid of this institution and stop worrying what what they're going to do next, which is wrong, which is going to hurt hurt the economy. Because you know then they'll turn around, decide to lower rates or, or allow more money to flow into the economy at the wrong time, and they'll tighten at the wrong time, and um, they have a lot of other power, which is not really discussed either. And I, I mentioned this over and over again. Freedom of Information Act brought this out. I mean, they're buying bonds of private companies and stocks of private companies. Uh, one of the most notable examples, they bought stock, I think it was back in 2008 in Harley-Davidson, the motorcycle company. So you tell me what the hell they're doing doing that. You know what I mean? So it, it's really over-the-top stuff. And, uh, you know, by, you know, no one's afraid to speak up. You know, uh, maybe, so maybe we're starting to see some of it now. But this is one of the improvements we need. And, uh, you know, again, this is not going to solve the inflation problem tomorrow. But I think it would create a more level playing field for the world and the world economies, not having somebody uh, toying around with stuff the way this institution has been doing. Now, of course, the European bankers are just as bad, you know, um, They've been holding interest rates to zero, uh, Draghi uh, over there for a number of years, trying to stimulate an economy, and it didn't really work. And uh, I think they're going to try to raise some rates now, maybe following in the steps of the U.S. Uh, but they've done a pretty incompetent job in Europe uh, with the euro and their central bank. So it just makes, you know, it's just common sense. The life experience and the data tell you what's going right and what's going wrong, and we need to get rid of the wrong stuff. So anyway... To answer your question, the Fed may will continue to raise rates. It probably will be detrimental to the economy short term. It won't solve overall the inflation problem. It's creating more havoc than it's uh, creating, you know, positive events. Um, what we need to do is uh, get oil flowing in the U.S. produced here, getting things on the uh, on the monetary. I mean, on the economic side, on the fiscal side. 
not the monetary side, straightened out. Stop spending money like crazy. Stop sending a billion dollars to Ukraine. Uh, you know, just stop all these social and government programs. I mean, if you cross the border in the U.S., you know, you're given uh, a lot of freebies. You know, a lot of money, uh, re- residence money, education, health care. As a U.S. citizen, you don't get this stuff. You have to work and pay for it. So where is this coming from? It's being printed by the uh, Democrats and by those in Washington who are trying to buy votes. And they're destroying uh, our uh, fiscal system by increasing the debt. And the debt has to be eliminated. So uh, Andrew Jackson did it. I guess we could do it. It may be a little painful at first, but I think if you just have spending and stop a little bit, slow things down, that would be the first uh, right uh, step. And none of this I'm saying is going to happen, you know, because I'm a lone voice out there. People like to spend money. It's politically convenient for those in power, particularly when they help their constituencies. It's helpful when you're trying to buy votes. So uh, they're not going to stop spending money so fast. And the only counterbalance we have is the Federal Reserve. But, again, they only can do so much. And uh, they're incompetent in what they, they tend to do anyway. They're late in raising rates now. They're going to probably be late in lowering rates. And, uh, you know, in terms of expanding or contracting the money supply, I'm sure they'll screw up on that as well. They've done it many times before. And, like, again, that's only part of the uh, damage that they can inflict by, you know, their actions. One positive may be, now I know it's, I don't know if it's under the purview of the, um, Fed directly, but Ronald Reagan created the Plunge Protection Team back in 1988. I think it's 13624 Executive Order, which is most commonly known as the uh, Working Group of Financial of, on Financial Markets. Whether the Treasury is involved in that and they got their dirty hands in that, or it's the uh, Federal Reserve, but the ability to go in and support the stock market, buying the S and P, you know, buying individual stocks, as I just mentioned, uh, maybe they're in there. And, uh, maybe they, you know, they could help temper or maybe help exacerbate the decline we're experiencing in the stock market depending on their action or inaction. But that, that power does exist on the government side too. So there have been a stock traders, which is, you know, again, not much discussed. I don't discuss at all when you turn on financial television that they're in there through their big, the big brokerage firms, um, with unlimited money behind it, uh, moving in the, uh, in the stock market itself. So that's uh, a lot of fun stuff going on out there. How is it all going to resolve? Well, only time will tell. But I'm not much. I'm not much of an optimist. Are we continuing to see quantitative easing, or are we now seeing quantitative tightening? It's tightening right now in the sense that they're. Um, I don't know if they're. Yeah, it would be defined, I guess, as tightening because they're 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 contracting the amount that it, that they're playing around with with their electronic books. So. I would say it would be more of a con- contraction event right now by denying the market the extra liquidity that it had been expecting and looking for. Is gold more likely to start running after interest rates have peaked? I don't know when gold's going to run. Honestly, it should have run before now. Um, my good friends, um, Bill Murphy over at... Uh, Gata.org. I have that posted on my website. You got to go to their website. Uh, by the way, they accept donations over there. Um, they've been doing 20 years of research, and the problem is yeah, the gold market is manipulated by the government, by all the governments on some level, and it's a manip- it's not a free market. Um, we've, there are instances. There's been lawsuits against some of the big firms. I'm not going to mention the name, which were successful accusing them of manipulating the futures markets in silver. And, um, you know, it's the government that's funding this. And, unfortunately, this is the, this is the plain truth. And I, don't, I can spend here an hour ranting and raving, but go to gata.org, see the documentation. Gold should already be probably ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 an ounce. Silver should be probably 100 or $200 an ounce. But the powers that be, are trying to hold, have been trying, and they've been successful in holding prices back to a great degree um, because of the fear that they, you know, government loses credibility. They, they, they poo-poo gold as a worthless, you know, a, a, antique uh, commodity. You know, you get the Treasury Secretary like Yellen or somebody out there, or her predecessor, and they'll sort of diminish it. Meanwhile, all the major governments store their gold and they protect their gold. 
I mean, look what China and Russia have been doing. Russia, you know, is backing the ruble with gold, and China's been hoarding gold. I think gold uh, may be uh, the largest holder may be China right now. They know that for thousands of years, currencies come and go, governments come and go, and we know that. Uh, most currencies end up going to zero, but gold's always there. Now, the question is, what's it worth? You know, what does it buy you? Well, it may not be worth 2000 an ounce. Who knows what that's worth because you're pricing it in dollars, but it buys you food. It buys you clothing. It's internationally uh, and uh, it's timely, you know, accepted. And this is the value of it, that it, uh, it, it surpasses our lives and government's lives, and this is why it's important. And uh, the more the higher it goes up, or the less credibility the government has. So it's a problem. The U.S. dollar is still strong. Do you expect this strength to continue? Well, if the uh, war in Europe expands, which I suspect will be the case, since we're sending a billion dollars over to Ukraine and we're trying to antagonize Putin more than we should be, um, the dollar will be a bastion of strength, even though it's probably the last horse in the uh, glue factory since the, the money we're spending here and the monetary side is so screwed up and, as we know, the Fed is messed up. So um, temporarily, it'll probably be the place to go. Of course, I do favor the Canadian dollar more because it's a resource-based currency and it's backed by you know not only uh, the gold and silver but by the forestry and natural resources in canada and uh on and on and on so it's it i think that's a safer long-term currency to want to be involved with though it, it does trade at a discount of course to the u.s dollar inverse on a certain level of course but uh to answer your question it probably will go higher as a short short-term uh source of security or safety for those who believe that, that that's where they should go. Is the price of crude oil key to the health of the stock markets, interest rates, commodities, and the U.S. dollar? Absolutely. I mean, a rise in crude oil is a tax on everybody. And uh, this is a known fact. And the higher it is and the higher gasoline is, it hurts business. It hurts people's business. People's ability to pay bills. Are they getting raises adjusted for the increase in what it costs for them to get to work. Businesses have to factor that into the pricing of their uh, production and ultimately what they price their products and services for. It's a, ta- it's a tax. and uh, It raises the cost of living. It raises expenses across the board. So uh, it's definitely a negative to see it go up, but it's being forced to go up because of idiocy in Washington, and uh, that is you know, a problem, and, you know, we're going to see, I think, uh, as I mentioned probably months ago on this broadcast, I mean, it may be a five- or ten-year comment, but, you know, gold, crude oil could be three, $400 a barrel. It could be at some incredible level because production has been reduced or curtailed or stopped, and there's still demand for it around the world, and not every country in the world is going to suddenly want to have EVs driving all over the place or the ability to generate energy to charge those EVs. So it could take a century for, uh, you know, cr- to get rid of crude oil. And I think you ultimately can, can't get rid of it because we need it as a, as a product to produce other products. I mean, if you look at all your computers and your equipment and your iPhone and, uh, parts and, you know, all, in your home, I mean, there's plastics that are, that are generated from, uh, crude oil. I mean, there's so many things that are related to crude oil other than as an energy source to drive your vehicle. So, you know, if they keep cutting it back and demand for it continues to go up, I mean, there's no limit to how uh, crude oil could be more valuable than gold. I mean, it could have that kind of pricing if the stupidity continues. So uh, overall, a little correction here is occurring. The multi-year comment, I think, much higher in the crude oil market. So um, is that going to force people to buy EVs? Well, can you buy them? Can you afford them? And, and, and will there be charging stations uh, are available to you? And more importantly, will there be power? the back the charging station so that you can even charge everybody tomorrow had the money to go out and eat, have it eat, to buy an EV and go charge it uh, there wouldn't be enough power to power those vehicles it's going to take at least probably 20 30 years for us to generate enough power to generate and power the vehicles that the, the powers that be want us to be uh, driving um, honestly I think the end the you know the answer is nuclear energy it's nuclear energy to provide the power and maybe nuclear energy in the vehicles themselves. 
you know, as we saw in Back to the Future, that 1983 uh, science fiction film where they had a, f- a fusion uh, uh, g- generator in the car. I mean, ultimately, just as we have uh, ships at sea and submarines at sea running on nuclear power and we have vehicles in outer space, ultimately we're probably going to have to have compact, safe nuclear generators inside of your car as a way to uh, provide unlimited and, and hopefully safe energy at that at, you know, at that point, it may take time, but we have the technology to power big vehicles right now, so that might be the ultimate solution. Could all the cryptocurrencies be on their way to zero? It could be. Anything is possible. I mean, we're in a crypto winter, as they're now uh, suggesting it. I've been you know, more of a big-picture bull because of my distrust of government and currencies and, and monetary policy, and uh, I think that's the reason why Bitcoin and other... Uh, currencies came into existence people want privacy uh they don't want government knowing what they're doing they don't want to be tracked and uh this was a way of of you know circumventing the system of course the government hates this just like they hate gold and that's why they've been depressing it all these years question is government tries to depress it will they be successful or will there be a black market or a secret market going on uh, other than shutting down the internet i don't know how they could stop it by my model that I put together, and I have this product called the Annual Forecast Model, which I highly urge any of listeners to take a look at because it has these charts that predict, you know, I think it's 100%, but predict like general direction for crude oil or for the stock market or for Ethereum or Bitcoin. There's different charts in that report. It's called the Annual Forecaster, the VR Forecaster. It's on the homepage of VR Trader. Uh, those, those reports uh, that we put out earlier in the year said you would see a correction this year in Ethereum and Bitcoin, and we'd be sort of in a down-sloping corrective phase this year. So that's what I think is happening. It's a correction in a, in a market. We've already seen Bitcoin go crazy, you know, uh, to the upside and all the way down to a couple thousand dollars and then back up to $80,000. So uh, my overall feeling it's a correction in a multi-decade uh, or multi-century bull market where people were trying to avoid government. What are rising interest rates likely to do to the real estate market and consumer spending? Well, initially rates uh, increase demand for real estate because uh, people get are fearful they're going to miss out, so they better rush in and buy before rates go even higher. Uh, ultimately, it could slow things down and historically tends to slow things down. Um, so it, it's not it's not a, a, a positive. And the question is also is how high of rates are you talking about? Are we talking about the rates back in 1979, 1980, where, you know, uh, Volcker got the uh, prime rate, not the prime rate, the discount rate up to 15%. And home mortgages, I think, were 11 or 12% back then. So uh, it depends, you know, things were slow. Of course, there were a lot of negotiated deals back then, if I recall, because I was there at the time. You know, you didn't have to necessarily went to the bank. The seller sometimes took the mortgage back and negotiated a better rate than you would get from the banks because they were so ridiculous at the time. So um, people still need a place to live. There's still shortage of housing. Um, it depends where it, location is everything. Uh, so it, it, some markets it might impact more than others. But the, the bottom line answer is, you know, increasing rates, uh, you know, have a tendency to put a damper on on real estate contingent on what supply of real estate exists at the time. If there's nothing around, you have to buy something. Prices are going to stay the same or go higher. And, um, you know, how much the buyer can afford. So there are some variables here, but you know, generally it's a bit, you know, a bit more negative if it, if it, if it sustains for a period of time. Short term, it, it may not have that much of an effect. Are cannabis stocks being ignored now? Oh, uh, that's an understatement. They talk about a, uh, a, uh, a bear market or a winter in crypto. Uh, we've been seeing that same thing in the cannabis sector that's been going on now for uh, a couple years. And uh, some of the companies are in the U.S. are making money, but their stocks are still down. And uh, it's you know it's frustrating. They got overdone, big blow off here in the last couple three years, and they just been in a correction, and they just can't seem to pull them their way out of it. There was a lot of hope that the federalization, legalization in the U.S. would turn things around. So far, we haven't seen the legislation, and I don't know if that's going to make a lot of difference anyway, but we'll find out if and when that legislation goes through. Um, it just, uh, they got overpriced, uh, overspent, and it was just, it was a hot trade, and at some point it will come back, you know, whether it'll come back to the levels that it was 
in the last two, three, four years. I know we were in early. We were in the first newsletters out there back in 2014 and actually recommended the cannabis stocks at the World Outlook Conference in Vancouver uh, and actually was laughed at at the time when I made the recommendation that weed and uh, and marijuana should be a new place. And some stocks, you know, like uh, it was weed, which is now canopy growth. I think it was a buck or two a share and ended up going to $66 a share. But it took three or four years for that to happen. So everything runs in cycles. And um, I don't know, again, whether it's going to come back to the level it was before, but at the present, there's no confirmation of a bottom. And uh, though I see some signs of some buying interest in some of the names, and they're so cheap that they've been in the bear market for a couple of years versus the overall stock market, which has only been a few months, you know, you might see the cannabis stocks turn up before the overall stock market because they've already come down so much and I'm so much ahead of them in terms of a correction. But um, it's a viable commodity. The CBD and the marijuana are very helpful to people's health. It's an alternate form of treatment for a lot of you know symptoms and diseases out there. And, you know, the medical profession wasn't too happy, still so isn't too happy about it. But it's been around like gold for thousands of years and seems to have uh, helped people. So uh, eventually uh, these stocks will, uh, will do better. There have to be perhaps more consolidation in the industry. Companies have to consolidate and merge, just uh, reduce the competition. And, you know, production, there was oversupply issues, too much was being produced. Uh, so the market will work things out in time. Uh, so I guess overall still a bull, big picture, no confirmation, short term of a bottom quite yet. Are there any sectors you like in these market conditions? Uh, well, I like the inverse ETFs. And I, even though I made the negative comments about gold and silver, I think they're still cheap and there's still a play coming there. You know, before this... Uh, Bear cycle is over, you know, which could be a year or two, may not just be a few months. You know, each dog has its day, as they say, and gold and silver will have a play here. So, uh, you know, you got to keep a close eye on those. Um, they, they seem to be trying to rally, and whether the forces that be allow it to rally is going to be the big question. And, uh, you know, I'm still a big proponent of solar. You know, I don't think that solves our energy problems, but I think it's great to have, you know, in terms of alternate energy just in case the grid goes down, you know, what if there's a cyber attack or, a, you know, or something, you know, on our infrastructure, you know, we have a lot of enemies around the world. We know that they don't have to, you know, they, I, I don't agree that it's Russia, even though everybody thinks it's going to be Russia, you know, it could be the Iranians, it could be China, you know, and suddenly uh, your power goes down and you don't have, you know, you can't keep your food uh, cool. You have no lights or heat or air conditioning. So, Solar is, you know, for an individual use, is, is a great value. And I think it's something every, like having an insurance policy on your car or your home, if you could have a power source uh, like solar um, or, you know, an alternate energy source, uh, that's fantastic. And it would apply to businesses as well as individual homes. So I, I still see that many of the stocks are down, but uh, they're, they're corrected with the market. So, you know, it's, it's always I keep my eye out for trades for the uh, big name solars because I still think, uh, you know, there's a place for them on a practical basis. And, you know, it's tough to fight the trend in the market, Jim. You know, I mean, the market's going down. The, they, they say they throw the baby out with the bathwater. So when the, the tides uh, go in the wrong direction, it's hard for stocks to rally. But uh, I do favor that group as well. What are you watching in geopolitics? Well, you know, I'm pretty much watching what's happening in Europe. And what's happening, as I mentioned earlier, with the U.S. funding Ukraine and what's happening in Iran. We have an administration in Washington that, you know, is uh, defeating the gains that were made with Donald Trump and others uh, in terms of curtailing a, a power which is trying to destroy Israel and ultimately a ter sending terrorists all over the world, including the U.S., so, uh, you know, you just got to watch, watch all these uh, political areas. I mean, it, it, it's really uh, not too good news out there because uh, we're dealing with people that would take us out. I mean, China, I'm sure, would have the opportunity. They would take over the United States where they do it militarily, uh, which some people are saying could ultimately happen, particularly if they take guns away from people in the U.S. and, and block that Second Amendment, uh, or, or whether they do it economically. And, you know... Uh, the situation in Europe, I think, is very, very dangerous, and we're sticking our nose into a situation which we shouldn't be, uh, cutting off supplies and trying to uh, 
uh, squeeze Russia to do things that we think it should do versus what it's doing. It reminds me of the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor. We knew that that was coming ahead of time. We had blockaded uh, and prevented crude oil from reaching them. They had every reason to try to reach out and attack their enemy, which was us at the time. And why wouldn't uh, Russia and other people uh, do the same against us if we do something crazy in uh, in Europe? So, you know, we're setting the stage for a uh, big problem. So I, um, I'm i sort of in the World War Three camp, and uh, I don't know how bad it could get, whether it would be nuclear or not, but we're, we're definitely not playing our cards correctly. And uh, we're, we're unfortunately, this is going to affect the market. It's going to affect the crude oil prices. It's going to correct... Uh, uh, complicate the supply chain issues and all kinds of things and uh, of the, the supply of food. And um, as a result, I'm not much of an optimist. But as long as I suppose the bottom line here, you know, if you're listening to this broadcast, I guess you're looking to make money. And I guess there's always money to be made uh, somewhere. So if I'm right about some of these uh, ongoing negatives, there's going to be plenty of trades on the inverse ETFs for a lower stock market. There's going to be plays in crude oil, which still probably still go a lot higher before this is all over. There's going to be plays in the uh, precious metals as people seek security or safety. Uh, all kinds of fun stuff uh, is coming. So, uh, you know, you just have to play the game. You know, I would, I'm, I would sort of consider myself a survivor, uh, having done this since 1979, and I'm still here talking about it. So I'm sure we'll figure it out. We have up to this point. It's geocosmic time. Are you seeing any geocosmic indicators for the markets? Nothing really hot. I keep uh, checking the um, uh, spaceweather.com website, and there was a uh, a solar flare which was due today, and they called M-class solar flare. And we've had a few of these over the past few weeks, by the way, and and nobody's really talking about them, but shortwave was cut off in certain parts of the globe, I think in Southeast Asia, when one of these flares, uh, you know, spurted out of the sun. And, you know, uh, there's one coming. And, uh, of course, we have to worry about a bunch of other stuff, volcanic activity. Um, uh, China just says it detected six signals from an alien civilization. It was just published uh, uh, yesterday. You go to Bloomberg, and it was actually two days ago, they had this thing called the China Sky Eye, which is this huge... Uh, uh, dish that sits out in China, you know, searching the universe for extraterrestrial life. So they came up with a report that they got some signals. It's in the uh, Gulzhou Go- Go- province, G-U-L-Z-H-O-U province. The de- measures is about 500 meters in size. So they uh, detected some suspicious alien, supposedly alien signals. So that just came off the news in the last couple of days. So uh, there's always something. We do have the summer solstice coming up here on the, uh, you know, the 21st, which is next the week. Uh, so sometimes, you know, I've been writing about this for years. You get changes of direction in the market within a couple of weeks of the solstice, and you tend to get sometimes, not always, a summer rally. So maybe the lows we saw here the last couple of days in the stock market may maybe attributed to the solstice uh, as a temporary stopping point before we go much lower, which we will later, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a uh, new moon on the 28th. Sometimes this changes directions around the lunar cycle, so keeping an eye on that. And, uh, you know, that big disaster we had up in Yellowstone the last uh, few days, which is really intriguing. I mean, it's one of my favorite places. And we're always talking about, you know, Earth events and things that you just never predict will happen, whether it's a volcano going off or a tsunami. I mean, I was going to go up there this summer, and Yellowstone was one of my target destinations, and they're talking about how they may have to keep it closed for a while, but there's unexpected flooding and destruction up there. It just shows you have to respect Mother Nature. Uh, we talk about geocosmic. We talk about a lot of things, you know, whether it's... Uh, Hurricane season, which has now started, how many of those are going to hit the U.S. and what kind of damage, if any, is that going to create? And, uh, uh, you know, these are all areas that we have to respect, so we keep our eyes and ears out for those. And, unfortunately, you know, many of these come by surprise, like the Yellowstone event, and uh, they do change, they do and can't affect markets and uh, our lives. So we talk about it because uh, it's there and uh, what the Fed does, or what the President of the United States or or other leaders say have no real bearing on what Mother Nature decides. So, 
keep your eyes and ears open, folks. There's always going to be stuff like this, and uh, you know, we uh, we try to talk about it and see if we can correlate it with what's happening here in the financial markets here at VR Trader. Mark, there's something else that caught your eye in the geocosmic uh, world. Right. Over the uh, previous weekend, there were these unexplained cattle deaths in Kansas. They claimed up to 10,000 head of cattle and it defied explanation. So uh, NASA apparently warned of some deadly magnetosphere rift that can cause mass extinction. So talk about geocosmic. So apparently, according to NASA, as the magnetosphere weakens, combined with ozone layer depletion, these natural for- forces can cause rifts or gaping holes in the shielding that normally protects Earth from UVB rays emanating from the sun. So the flipping of magnetic north and south poles results in this weakening of the magnetosphere, and this process is already underway on a planetary scale right now. So the mass death of, death of the cattle could be one of the first warning signs that the magnetosphere is failing. I mean, this is almost like talking about, you know, a polar shift. I mean, polar shifts could be very minor or dramatic. Dramatic ones could wipe us out. I mean, you know, that could uh, create the ice ages or kill dinosaurs or whatever. But, you know, but the meanwhile, if there's any instance that the magnetosphere is weakening and it's possibly related to a polar shift, uh, that's one way to help the bear market uh, accelerate. I would tell, I would say that. So this just came, this just came out over the last couple of days. So, uh, again, we have to respect the geocosmic, Jim. Here's another example of what nobody talks about and what could possibly happen. Mark, can you remind us again about your special offer? It is. It's 50% off, and I encourage you to look at that annual forecast model because that's really going to help you out in terms of market direction and some of the key markets. It's uh, vrtrader.com, and it's, uh, the promo code is 2020 half off, 2020 half off, and that's your promo code for 50% off of any of the newsletters, including the forecast model. Mark, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Great being here. Thanks for having me. My guest has been editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR newsletters, Mark Leibovit. He's also known as VRTrader.com. Mark was speaking to us from Arizona. Coming up, Steve Soretsky, next on This Week in Money. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Steve Soretsky. He's a Vancouver-based realtor. You can find him online at SteveSoretsky.com. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Is the June issue of the Soretsky Report out, and how can people get it? Yeah, we uh, it's published on our website there at SteveSoretsky.com. So if you fumble around the homepage there, you'll find it, and it's... Uh, I don't know, 10, 15 pages of sort of my thoughts on the uh, Vancouver housing market. So, uh, yeah, feel free to go check that out. With inflation continuing to rise, when it gets traction, is it difficult to stop its rise and then turn it lower? Uh, well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, obviously, like, inflation, I think, is still somewhat of a mystery, and there's arguments about how it's, you know, how it comes to be. Is it strictly on the monetary side, the fiscal side? You know, as an expansion of the monetary base, uh, I think a lot of it definitely is psychological, and I think that's certainly what the central banks talk about a lot, which is inflation expectations, and they're concerned about inflation expectations basically becoming anchored, i.e., if everybody continues to believe that inflation will run at 5% per year for the next, you know, several years, and then a lot of them are inclined to sort of accumulate things ahead of time and start buying in advance of those prices because they're going to be higher next year. So, uh, that's when inflation can kind of get uh, to be a, a dangerous, slippery slope. And I think that's why we're seeing, you know, the Bank of Canada and, and, and whatnot, uh, obviously being very aggressive on the rate hike, uh, rate hike, rate hike tightening cycle here. Are falling retail sales and increasing inflation a recipe for recession? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there's certainly arguments. I think we're maybe already even in one 
or extremely close to it, right? I think that, uh, you know, sentiment is pretty negative. Obviously, housing activity has dropped like a stone, and that housing activity plays such a major role in, in our economic growth here in Canada. So, you know, I think we're, if we're not in one, I think we're getting extremely close to one. So it's something definitely worth watching. What does tightening their balance sheet mean, and is the Bank of Canada doing it? Uh, the Bank of Canada has so expanded their their QE program, uh, basically purchasing government bonds. You know, during the onset of the pandemic, and since then they've basically been letting them. Uh, basically, I believe they're rolling them off. I'm not sure if they're actually reinvesting expiring mature uh, securities there. Um, my understanding is they're letting them roll off now, so their balance sheet is slowly has peaked and is beginning to sort of roll over. But, um, you know, I think the process of unwinding that and getting back down to where we were sort of pre-pandemic is probably going to be a, a tough hill to climb. Can stock markets and interest rates run higher together? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a sort of a stagflationary environment. It's, it's possible, right? I mean, if your stock market's going up, you know, four percent a year, but inflation's running at seven or eight. I mean, you're you're obviously losing in real terms. So I think it's always important to measure things in real terms. Um, uh, you know, especially in today's environment where you've got thirty-year highs in inflation. You know, if you're earning again, you know, three percent in your GIC today, I mean, with inflation at eight, you're really losing five percent a year. So, um, and that's really obviously, I think, is important because it highlights the magnitude of the you know erosion of, of people's savings and wealth right now, right? With inflation at eight, if you just got money in the bank, you know, sitting in your checking account, you know, earning zero percent, I mean you're basically being taxed on your on your money by about eight percent per year. So um it really is a basically it's a wealth tax is really what it is. And so or it's a tax on your savings. I think that tends to impact you know, disproportionately the the lower income uh, class, which, you know, has very few savings to begin with and, you know, seeing the, the very few savings they have being sort of, you know, taxed and, and not only that, but the prices that they have to consume are, are significantly higher, particularly at grocery stores and at the pump, I think really impacts those individuals the most. The Bank of Canada meets in July again in September. Right now, does it look like the Bank of Canada rate could be increased by 50 or even 75 basis points at each of those meetings? Well, yeah, I mean, I think they, they are going to follow the Fed in, in, in July here at 75 basis points. I think it was, last I looked, there was about an 85% rate hike odds uh, on a 75 basis point move from the Bank of Canada. So um i think that one's pretty much baked into the cake and again i think people have to understand as well like some of the how, how central bank pricing tends to work is a lot of the times the markets will sort of force their hand and, and guide them right you know so for example if the market's pricing in you know 85 percent odds of a 75 basis point rate hike and all of a sudden uh you know you, you don't deliver any rate hikes or you deliver a 25 basis point rate hike uh, you know, you, you, the release valve is your currency. Your currency gets crunched, and and uh, and so and it obviously just ingrained inflation expectations even further. So it's kind of a slippery slope. So at the end of the day, I think the market's pushing the Bank of Canada towards seventy five basis points. Uh, so that's kind of what we'll go, what we'll expect here in July. Steve, is it possible to mathematically predict the percentage drop in real estate prices following the Bank of Canada rate increases in July and September? No, I don't think it's mathematical. I mean, if it was mathematical, there would be a lot of millionaires and billionaires sitting here. We'd all be extremely well off, and we'd all just be sitting here predicting housing markets. So um, I think that housing is extremely emotionally driven. Uh, it's a very sticky asset class. Um, you know, and again, it's, it's much different than the stock market. I always have to sort of, you know, I have lots of these conversations with uh, a lot, you know a lot of my finance clients and and, and colleagues and whatnot because uh, it's it, it's just a much different asset class and uh, you know again if it was it was if it was always that simple again I think there was a lot of people I always point back to the onset of the pandemic you know record job losses people panicking people concerned about the end of the world and you know we went on to have the single largest increase in national home prices uh, on record so. You know, while everybody was sitting there, including the head of CMHC, which is our government agency, with I think they have over 100 uh, hired economists there uh, running all their models, and they were not able to predict. In fact, you know, I think they were calling for a 9 to 18% decline in house prices, and it went 
you know, I think it, we, I think we increased 18% that year. So, um, yeah, not, uh, certainly not mathematical. I think that certainly, you know, I think you can always put two, two and two together and say, well, I mean, higher rates, uh, you know, mortgage rates at 5% on top of record house prices and, and households that are already struggling with affordability, uh, I think it's pretty clear that there, you're going to see downwards pressure on pricing and, and we're already seeing that. So. Are Canada's banks continuing to raise mortgage rates? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously priced like off the bond market, right? So the bond market's pricing, you know, the mortgage market for, for the banks and, and, you know, not the banks pricing it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we've seen obviously a rapid increase over the past six months. You've seen basically a doubling of mortgage rates, right? We've gone from your five year fix at the start of the year around two and a half percent to today we're at, uh, just over five percent now actually and, and getting closer, inching closer to five and a half percent. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously shouldn't come as a surprise to see, I think, I think actually the fastest pace of increases ever on record in terms of, uh, mortgage rates doubling in such a short span so you know anytime you go from the doubling of mortgage rates in basically five months uh, i really shouldn't come as a surprise to see that housing activity is ground grind to a to a halt what's happening in the metro vancouver housing market in the high mid and low ends for detached and condos uh yeah i mean it really is a mixed bag i mean this is you know part of the thing i know everybody like just read a media headline and say oh yeah markets you know crashing or what have you and you know this it's a very much a mixed bag so we're seeing the majority of the price declines uh in sort of the the areas which i think you know a were more frothy that saw immense growth um you know that's the suburbs i think the suburbs was also a pandemic trade which is hey i'm going to work from home forever who needs to ever be in the city again. So that trade, you know, coupled with the timing of the pandemic ending, but also interest rates, those suburban markets are getting hit the hardest. I think you also have to factor in, like, so you got that. Uh, so we're seeing detached townhouses in particular. Those are coming off the most. The entry-level condos, whether that be in the suburbs or in the city of Vancouver in particular, are holding up actually quite well. Prices are really quite sticky. Inventory is still low. Um, there's just a lot of people trying to squeeze in for affordability reasons. So these, you know, these one bedrooms at five hundred thousand dollars or five fifty are just they're they're still tight. And um, you know, and then at the higher end of the market, you know, if you go look at the west side of Vancouver, detached houses, you know, north of four million are actually still trading fairly well. So, uh, and and part of the reason for that is I don't think if you're buying a four million dollar house, you're a lot less impacted by you know, mortgage rates at, you know, four and a half, five percent. Uh, I think where you get the rate sensitivity again is in these blue collar working class neighborhoods where, you know, a, a, a young family that's already got two kids paying for daycare and is seeing their grocery bill go up, you know, they, they can't really stomach a mortgage rates going from two and a half to five. So that's where you're starting to see most of the, uh, price declines or corrections happening in those markets. Bob Rennie of Vancouver Realtor is saying that detached homes in West Vancouver and on the west side of Vancouver proper are now in a buyer's market. What's your view on that? Uh, I like I said, I think those are holding up a lot better, to mm-hmm. be honest. I mean, um, I, I don't think, like, if you look at the west side, detached houses, though, I mean, they they haven't really moved since 2016. I mean, if you bought in 2016, you kind of break even. So there's not a lot of froth in that market, in my opinion. I mean, prices came down from 2016, bottomed in 2018, picked up again, and sort of had a bit of an acceleration during the pandemic. But on a whole, I mean, they've been flat for almost six years now. So um, I don't know. I, I don't get too worried about that market. Do I, I think there'll be some modest corrections there, for sure. I get more concerned about you know townhouses in Langley and Abbotsford, Surrey, that have doubled in three years. With further interest rate hikes in the future, are the high-end markets likely to get hit the hardest? No, no, not at all. Uh, Like I said, I just think that uh, where's the interest rate sensitivity? Again, people that are buying $5 million houses aren't buying them on 80% leverage. Uh, So, you know, uh, it's a different cohort of buyers, right? Like I said, we talked at the beginning of the show about 
where people are most sensitive if for inflation it tends to be the sort of you know the, the the lower income households again people that are sorry squeezing into the housing market young families all of a sudden seeing their mortgage rate double uh, that's where you're going to see the squeeze yeah and your gasoline bill to get groceries and pick up the kids what is that done to people looking at buying a house has that yeah, had I an mean, impact let's, let's, let's be honest i mean if you're living in a five billion dollar house you're not flinching at the pump. Um, you know, you're probably not wincing when you go into the grocery store. Yeah, it's a minor inconvenience. But that's about it. So, uh, yeah, again, I just think that it's important to make that distinction. If real estate ends up going no bid due to rising interest rates, could we see significant price drops this fall? Uh, I mean, I think we've already seen some pretty significant price declines right i mean um i mean we've only we're only four months into this correction so you know like i said in the suburbs you've got prices off about 15 percent uh hearing stories of of even for you know more significant declines in the suburbs of toronto i think there's there was arguably a lot more froth and you know concerns over valuations there during the pandemic so uh yeah i mean i think like again rates will go up 75 basis points here in july Inventory, I think it's important to note. Like, if you look at inventory, inventory is still low. So it, it takes time for inventory to build. Like, we, the fact that we've even had, you know, 10, 15% correction with inventory at these levels is actually quite surprising. Uh, if you look at it, you're around three months of inventory. That is not a lot of inventory. Um, so, and it's important to remember, right? If you go back to January, February of this year, we had all time record low inventory. So, and if, like, if you look at new listings, there's no fire sale of listings. There's no flood of new listings hitting the, the market where sellers are rushing, panicking, and, and overloading the market with new listings. New listings were down. They were down month, year over year in June, or in May. And they'll probably be down again in June. So there's no, there's no, like, flood. Everybody thinks, like, oh, rates go up and, like, people just instantly start dumping their houses. Like, that's just, that's just not how it works. It's not what's happening at all inventory is building slowly because what's happening is instead of houses selling in three or four days on market they're now taking three weeks and so if every house takes three weeks to sell all of a sudden you know after several months you've got more inventory that's just on the market so it's not again it's not from a flood of listings crushing the market it's simply from inventory back backing up and it takes time right again if you're building inventory off record low bases it's going to take time for that inventory to get back to healthy levels, even in a bear market. With bosses asking people to come back to the office to work at least part way through the week or a few times a week, anybody giving up their rural spacious property to come back to the big crowded city? Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you've seen too much of that yet. Like anecdotally, it's obviously extremely difficult to track. I think that if you look at the rental market, um, in particular, you know, inner city Vancouver here, downtown rental prices, it's pretty evident that the workers are coming back, at least the renters are. Um, you know, maybe, again, maybe a lot of these young people, uh, post pandemic here leaving mom and dad's basement and, and often re enter the, the rental market. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, I think rentals.ca, I've seen various other reports here. I just watched it anecdotally. I mean, you've got rent prices for one bedroom condo in the city up about 20% year over year. So the rental market is actually where all the strength is in the housing market. So everyone's talking about, you know, the cooling off and the softening in the resale market. But I mean, go look at the rental market. It's on fire. Um, it's incredibly tight out there right now. What are you hearing on the street from the buyers, sellers, and developers of real estate? Uh, buyers just being, you know, a little bit more cautious, wanting to take their time, wanting to, again, it was, when rates double, I think they're hoping that affordability hasn't gotten any better, right? I mean, like prices have come off, again, depending on the market, depending on the area, 5, 10, 15 percent. Like the prices arguably haven't come down enough yet to offset the higher cost of borrowing. So it's like the housing market on a whole haven't really got any more affordable uh and so buyers are kind of waiting and hoping that okay well the prices hopefully will come down a bit more to offset the the five percent mortgage that i now have to take on so that's a lot of the conversation developers i think we're starting to see some projects deciding just to hit pause again it's just not the risk reward for developers is just not that great right i mean there's still a shortage 
trades. Construction costs are still elevated. Financing costs of, of building that development have now doubled. It just makes projects like less feasible. Um, and the ability to pre-sell them, I think the pre-sell market is now softening. So for most developers, I think we're going to see a lot of them hit pause here. And, uh, you know, that will, that will kind of reverberate across the economy in, in several different ways. Are job losses increasing in the real estate industry? Uh, I mean, not particularly yet. I think, I mean, well, obviously from a more national perspective or from a North American perspective, you know, we saw two major firms in, in Redfin and Compass, you know, offloading and cutting their employee base by 10%. So uh, certainly in the U.S. you're seeing it uh, anecdotally here in Canada. I think we're going to start to see it. I mean, you know, remember, a lot of these banks expanded their mortgage uh, labor force by they almost double for a lot of these lenders. And so if mortgage credit growth goes from a 14-year high, which it was last year, to, you know, I don't know, 10, 20, 15-year lows, I don't know. Uh, I, think mortgage, it's, I think it's reasonable to assume that mortgage credit growth could very well get chopped in half here. And so, you know, you just doubled your mortgage uh, personnel and all of a sudden your, your lending volume dries up. So I think the writing's on the wall that there will be job layoffs uh, in that real estate space. It looks like the Trudeau government wants to throw billions of dollars at fighting inflation. Does that make any sense? No, well, I mean, I think it's entirely predictable, right? I mean, you're already seeing it in di- different other countries, and governments will do what they need to do, which is, you know, to to to, to maintain, you know, power and to stay in 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 power, right? So, uh, you know, certainly, I think a lot of this inflation, we can certainly argue the merits of it and how it came to be, but I think there's no doubt that you know, uh, fiscal policy had a role to play, right? I mean, if you start mailing checks to everybody during the pandemic and you know we shut down our our ability to to supply the demand i mean it's no, no question that part of the reason why we have inflation where it is today is because i think government's overstimulated and so you know now you've got the bank of canada aggressively raising rates trying to squash inflation and, and basically killing the economy in the process and you've got the government sort of you know trying to almost is almost offsetting part of that by by basically you know essentially printing more money and trying to hand it out to to lower income households. Like I think at the end of the day, like these are tough times and and we're going to have to endure some pain. So um, yeah, I mean hopefully the government can can figure that out soon enough. Could cryptocurrencies be getting wiped out on purpose to then usher in central bank digital currencies? I mean I don't have a strong opinion on that. Obviously I'll stick to my space. Um, but uh, you know, I think central bank digital currencies are obviously coming. I think uh, I think Jay Powell, the Fed, there was out actually today or yesterday talking about it. Uh, you know, they're calling it. I think they're calling it Fed Coin or Fed Wire next year. So, yeah, it, it's coming. Um, I certainly think. Like the one thing I will say is is that you know, in the crypto space, it's kind of you know more or less free markets. Like you know, you're seeing all these like big crypto companies and some of these institutions you're seeing you know the huge crypto hedge fund now like blowing up and basically going insolvent and like there's no bailouts right like this happens in sort of more and more the traditional finance financial markets i mean there's there's bailouts so um i don't think regulators or and, and policymakers have any desire to obviously bail out the crypto space between real estate, the stock markets, the bond market, and cryptos, are we witnessing a lot of wealth going to money heaven? <laughs> yeah, I think right now, just looking at today, it looks like it's about, you know, given, give or take, everyone's trying to get a uh, full assessment on this, but it's about $15 trillion uh, has been wiped out uh, in terms of basically the destruction of wealth. So we're at about $15 trillion, uh It looks like, yeah, in 2008, you're around $10 trillion. So... Um, yeah, it's been a destructive um, rate hike, rate hike tightening here, and uh, again, uh, we haven't seen you know bond yields at these levels in over a decade. So, uh, and there's a ton of debt in the world, and I think we're seeing that you know it, it, you can't really normalize interest rate policy um, without really blowing things up, and and that's what we're seeing, right? We're seeing blow ups across all sort of different sectors, and uh, yeah. So, what's happened to consumer confidence? 
I mean, I think it's consumer confidence is, is definitely changing. It's rolling over as it should. I mean, you know, you always see things anecdotally. I mean, you can look at, you know, the consumer confidence, was it the University of Michigan consumer, consumer confidence survey? I think that's at record lows, dating back to the 1970s. I mean, I think even here in Canada, we've got like a Bloomberg Nanos index, which measures people's sort of confidence with the real estate market. That's rolling over. Um, still in positive territory, mind you, but yeah, I mean, I think like consumer confidence, again, when you, when you wipe out $15 trillion of wealth and, and, you know, food prices are up and gas prices are up and your wage increases aren't, uh, you know, keeping up with the cost of living, like, I think people, uh, should naturally feel less optimistic and positive and I think that, that certainly plays a part probably into, you know, ultimately consumer spending. So again, if the central banks are trying to bring down inflation, one thing to do that is to make everybody, you know, poor and uh, make them not want to spend money. During times of significant inflation, how do people tend to prioritize their spending needs and where does real estate fit in? Well, I mean, I think like it's pretty obvious that Canadians will, you know, they'll rather go to their grave before they miss a mortgage payment. So uh, you know, typically speaking, you'll see obviously delinquencies on credit cards and whatnot before somebody misses a, you know, a mortgage payment, or you know, they'll they'll, they'll happy to miss their, their their car payment before they they miss the mortgage payment. So, um, you know, that's why I think mortgage arrears, for example, are such a lagging indicator. It's not a great leading indicator, of, you know, financial stress, right? Uh, I think we'll see that in, in other sectors of the economy, and that's you know, predominantly and first and foremost in, in consumption consumer spending and then you know vis-a-vis that i think you'll start to see it in credit in credit card delinquency so um yeah i mean that's that's kind of how i look at things uh, you know canadians love their housing and and they'll do whatever they can to to try to you know keep their, their, their keep current on their mortgage are there ways to short real estate in canada yeah, I mean, I'm not going to give investment advice on that. I mean, I think people can do their own sort of research on it, but, uh, but that's pretty much all I'll say on that. During bad real estate markets, are there benefits to buyers using a realtor? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, like, you know, it's easy for me to plug, obviously, but I think, like, right now is, I mean, we, we you know, we talk about this, you know, it's, you know, well, you have conversations with some of the top realtors in the city and not just in the city here, but across Canada. And, and to be honest, like, this is a good market for a lot of these agents. Um, it's, it, it weeds out, it weeds out a lot of the riffraff, a lot of the people that don't know what they're doing. I think everybody's well aware the entry to, the, the barrier to entry is quite low. And so, you know, in a bull market, you get a lot of, I think, like incompetent realtors that don't know what they're doing. They give bad advice to clients. And, uh, so, you know, basically what you see is like, you know, my job and some of these other people's jobs, they come in and clean up the mess. And it's to, to get, you know, cause you have to understand like things are moving at such a fast pace, right? We've just had the quickest tightening of, of, financial conditions in, in, in decades. And so, you know, you've got to look at the whole picture now. You've got to look at, you know, buying versus selling. When do you do it? Uh, how long is your rate hold? Are you able to, to transfer that mortgage? Um, you know, what's your prepayment penalties? You, you got to, you got to basically sit down. You got to have not only a good realtor, but you got to have a really good mortgage broker on your side and you got to put the whole picture together because, you know, I think like we look at, for example, uh, you know, everyone says, wow, prices really declined so quickly here. It's just a matter of, what, four months? You know, prices in the suburbs down, let's say, 15%. Well, I can tell you a lot of those were distressed sellers. Why were they distressed? Well, it's because, you know, they made the, 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 the poor decision and maybe poor advice from their realtor of buying in February at the top of the market, likely overpaying. Um, and then getting stuck with a property that they, they haven't yet sold. So now all of a sudden you own two properties in a liquid market and you're, you're basically forced to fire sell it. So a lot of that is just on, 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 I think just some of it comes down to that individual making poor decisions, but also some of it's on the advice of the realtor. Uh, just getting back to cryptos and NFTs, there was a virtual island where you could buy virtual real estate. People were spending over 200 grand to buy virtual land on a virtual island that didn't really exists. Steve, did you get a little chuckle out of that, knowing what could have you done in the real world with real estate with 200000 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, obviously, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's times like this where, you know, I think we're seeing, like, when the tide goes out, you know, where the amount of investment is, I think it kind of highlights the point of owning real hard assets, you know, physical real estate, you know, oil and gas companies, like tangible real things that the economy needs on a day-to-day basis. Uh, I still think long-term there's, there's probably a play in, in, in some of the NFTs and the metaverse and stuff. I think longer term, we're probably going there, but so many of these projects are going to fail and go to zero, and there's going to be a lot of money made and a lot of money lost. And, and uh, you know, like I said, I, I mean, I think some of the, you know, the greatest quotes out there is like, it, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's easy to get rich. It's a lot harder to, to, to stay rich. And so, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, this, this cycle is certainly is, is proving that. Steve, how can people get a hold of you and how can they get the latest issue of the Soretsky Report? Yeah, best way just to email me, steve at stevesoretsky.com. Uh, yeah, just reach out via email and then uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Steve Soretsky. I'm pretty active on there as well. Steve, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Yeah, thanks for having me on. My guest has been Steve Soretsky. He's a Vancouver-based realtor online at stevesoretsky.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Mark Leibovit, and Steve Soretsky. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray and the company's CFO, Shaheem Ali. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. My guests are Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, and Shaheem Ali, the CFO at American Manganese. First off, we start off with Larry. Larry, what's uh, going on at American Manganese right now? Well, there's some interesting things happening in the gold market. <clears throat> You'll see that uh, Barrick is talking about higher prices. And we have to remember one thing, that the largest commodity traded in the world is gold, bar none. And uh, so that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. But Barrick's been talking about a bullish market in gold. And I, I agree with them. The uh, simple matter of the simple matter is that uh, gold is uh, the longest ranging currency out there, and uh, it'll continue to hold that spot for many years to come. So all I can tell you is that uh, you know we've got some gold up on the Roche de Boul property. We got gold. We got copper. We got rare earths. We've got all kinds of things that are could be spark plugs for the market and uh we want to get going on the uh on the uh, copper gold scenario so uh i'm very bullish on uh copper gold and uh cobalt for that matter and uh, now with the latest results that we put out here a few weeks ago on uh on rare earths that makes it a heck of a lot better so I think we've got uh, we've got the makings of something happening up there. So uh, we want to get a drill program going up there. Uh, we've got the permits. We've got the permission from the uh, native group that holds the ground, and uh, well, we just go from there. But uh, you know, gold is uh, like I say, it's uh, one of the longest standing currencies out there. And it'll be a long-standing currency after everything else is gone. The whole aspect of it all is that uh, we've got a lot of metals up in, up on uh, Roche de Boule, including rare earths. And uh, any one of those could be uh, could take off. I mean, you don't know until you drill. That's the one thing that you never know. 
you never know until you drill the project, and we have to drill the project. This tent zone has been a project now for uh, a number of years and keeps getting, getting hot and getting cold, getting hot and getting cold. But you'll never know what's there until you drill, and uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do some drilling, that's for sure. Now, I've split this up a little bit so that uh, Jaheim will have time to talk on uh, his, his uh, reporting. I won't even touch on that because he's doing that. So uh, so all I can tell you is that uh, we want to get going, drill the vent project, drill the strike length of that vent, and uh, see if there's not some good mineralization in there. And uh, there's uh, always a potential when you drill of a discovery. So uh, we're looking, hopefully, to have that discovery this year. And uh, we'll go from there. Now, it's uh, a project near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, we've certainly got uh, Eric looking at uh, better prices in the gold market. And uh, I think that's very bullish for what we're doing. So uh, we'll uh, really looking for better prices, too. So the, uh, the aspect of the whole thing is when we get drilling, we keep our fingers crossed our legs crossed, and hope we hit the mother load. But, uh, you know, that won't happen to, unless you do the drilling. So uh, we want to get working on that. We'd like to start in July, which is about the time of our AGM, on, and uh, we can go from there. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, to uh, Shaheem and uh, let him carry the ball from here. Uh, thank you, Larry and Jim, for having me. Gold project is indeed near and dear to Larry. Jim, I plan on addressing some of the questions that we have received from our listeners and shareholders. Number one question we get on a regular basis is, what is going on with our demonstration plant? Where are we at? Where is our final LCA? Another question we get is, some shareholders are asking about AGM details, packages, and why the name change. Frequently, we get asked about potential, what are some of the potential meetings or JV or partnership or company marketing plans that we are executing right now. Uh, recently, or actually since our last financing, which was in October last year, we always get asked about what are our plans for uplisting to NASDAQ. And finally, I would like to share our next week's travel plan to Washington, D.C., Capitol Hill. So to answer the first point is, where are we with our demonstration plan? Jim, as previously shared, up till now, we have shredded all the cathode scraps that we have received. A batch of that shredded cathode material has been processed through a pre leach circuit that separates the active cathode materials from the aluminum foils. We have since washed, collected, and separated all the aluminum foils. We are now in the process of uh, accumulating separated cathode active materials for leaching stage. From the data we collected, our engineers are actually currently optimizing the pre-leach stage to meet the target throughput, which is a major step of these several overall operations. Once this stage is optimized for throughput, then we will continue pre-leaching remaining shredded materials. Jim, I want to say that as a company, we believe that we are building the right thing, but it is far more important that we build it right. We rely on our demonstration plan to provide data for CAPEX, OPEX, framework, the blueprint for scale-up to commercial plant. So what I'm saying is that these things take time and resources to ensure that interconnected equipments, feedstock flow rate, the reagents, centrifuges, and the filter presses all work as expected. From most of our meetings with potential customers, OEMs, investment community, as part of their decision-making process, we find that environmental, social, and governance requirements are very high on their list. Just recently, we learned that SEC, ISO standards are submitting proposals that will require companies to make increased climate disclosures to their shareholders and stakeholders. So we want to maximize ESG. We should have our finalized life cycle assessment hopefully next week, which is supposed to make our biggest climate impact statement. 
Next month, we are having our AGM online. That will be held on Friday, July 8th at 11 a.m. on Zoom. Hopefully, our shareholders can all attend. As we speak, you should be getting your AGM packages. At the AGM, our biggest recommendation is to accept the name change to Recyclico Battery Materials, Inc. Ticker symbols will stay the same, so no change there, just the name change. I want to share with our listeners that this name change is very timely. When we are at events talking about talking to analysts, funds, potential partners, we usually get confused as a mining manganese or commodity company. So I encourage all our shareholders to attend and please vote our proxies. We have been getting questions from our listeners. Are we talking or exploring business JV partnerships and marketing? Since travel has opened up in the past two and a half months, it has been very busy with meetings with potential partners, funds, and OEMs, all under NDA, however. In these meetings, we have to consider many things, such as rights and obligations of each side, the licensing rights, capital contributions, ratios, models for revenue, cost sharing, and many more. I want to ensure our listeners and investors, shareholders, that we are exploring all options to maximize shareholder value. Quite frequently, we also get asked about uplisting to NASDAQ. We have been researching and we have learned quite a bit in the last few months about uplisting requirements. We have had meetings with NASDAQ reps and so on, and we meet the most standards for uplisting. However, given the current market conditions, we feel that time is not the Time is not now for us to uplist. However, it is our plan, and we will do it when we cross that bridge. Jim, lastly, we will be attending Battery Gigafactory event next week on June 23rd, 24th at Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. It's hosted by Benchmark Minerals. This event is going to bring EV battery industry and U.S. policymakers together to talk about sustainable lithium-ion battery and supply chain. As we move from hyper-globalization to deglobalization, North American automakers are also considering moves into mining and onshoring refinement of battery raw materials to ensure that their EV production goals are met. Recycling, upcycling keeps attracting eyeballs at these events for green metals, and we will be there to do that. I hope I have answered your questions. Please keep it coming. Look forward to it. Thank you, Jim. Shaheem, where's American Manganese traded, and where can people get more information about the company? Sure, Jim. We are traded on TSX Venture under the symbol AMY, on US OTC QB, AMYZF, and on Frankfurt 2AM. You can reach us at 778-574-4444 or visit us on AmericanManganeseInc.com. Shaheem, thanks so much for being on Company Showcase. Likewise, thank you. My guests have been Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, and Shaheem Ali, CFO of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on June 17th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.